Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to have you all here. Didn't expect such a full room, honestly. Really good to see you. So today I'll be talking about how you can build an API with Go. And what I want to demonstrate here is different techniques and best practices to use Go and to, to make things work. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm not Batman, by the way. My name is Tiago. Um, I've been working as a software developer since around 2014. And my main programming languages used to be just Python and JavaScript, but more recently I learned Go and ever since I've been using it and it's been my, my preferred language uh, for developing software. Um, so I joined the Volkswagen Software Development Center in July 2018, even before we opened our offices here in Lisbon. And we actually did the um, uh, first part of our, of our internship, as we may call it, but it's not really an internship because you need to have experience. But we spent three months in Berlin in our brother offices in, in Berlin. Uh, and I started learning Go there uh, for a car connectivity framework. Um, and, and the language really helped us uh, to, to overcome some obstacles regarding performance issues and connectivity issues. So it's, it, it was really a game changer for, for the team there. Um, on a personal level, I love to play guitar and I'm also a summer surfer, but I wanna see if I start surfing a little bit more. Okay, so some little facts about Go, uh, or basically just a Wikipedia copy paste. So Go is designed by these three people, so Robert, uh, Griesmeyer, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. And it was developed within Google in 2000, and, and they made their release in 2009. And they actually wanted to create a language that would help them achieve a better productivity in this modern world. So what, what you will see today is that Go already has a lot of built-in features that with other languages you need 10 frameworks to do. In Go they put it built in because it was built for the future and for modern day computing. And one of the main motivations they had is that they really disliked C++, so they just went for it. So what is Go good for? It's, it's always a, a good question to ask, and it's always a, a question that people ask. So you, you can see Go being used in very, very different use cases. So you can make web servers with them, and this is one of the most common use cases. You can do command line utilities. You can make crawlers very easily. Uh, you can build proxies for whatever reasons you need to. Uh, and it's also really good for OS stuff. Uh, can anyone give me an example of a project they know about in, that's written in Go? Like famous projects in Go? Thank you. Sorry? Exactly. So you nailed it. So Docker is probably one of the most known projects that is built with Go. You also have Kubernetes, uh, and of course Kubernetes being made by Google, it's natural that they use this. Uh, so everything basically from HashiCorp, they do it almost all in Go. So if you go for HashiCorp uh, GitHub repository, you will see that it's Go, Go, Go everywhere. Um, you have another smaller example, Caddy is, is still a, a big one. Uh, a lot of people know Caddy. And even Ethereum has uh, Go port, so it's, it's, it's getting really, really massive. Okay, so why would you use this besides these use cases? So, of course, other programming languages also cover these use cases, so why Go? Well, first of all, Go is really simple and it's really explicit in what you're doing. So, for example, if you want a simple web server, this is all you need. You don't need a framework, you don't need anything, and take into account that there are two lines of code here that it's just a log. So this is a fully functional server. So if, if I start this server, I can now go to my web page, reload, and I have a hello world here working. And it's super easy, I have logs, and all I need to say is handle, uh, and when I hit this endpoint, do this. And so it writes hello world, we're happy, and it's super easy with only the standard library. So another reason to do, to do Go is still the standard library, but for example, one of the big challenges we have nowadays is marshalling and unmarshalling data. What this means is reading and writing JSON or XML files. 
Well, with Go, it's super simple. You just create a struct, and I'll go in more into more detail about these structs uh, ahead. But you just uh, create a struct, you read your file, and you just say, I want to unmarshal the contents of my file into my struct. And for this example, I'm just going to print whatever is in my file, and here you go. It's as simple as this, and all you need to do is define in your struct how you want your fields to be read. So concurrency. Go is really, really well known for its concurrency patterns and how it makes it so easy to use concurrency. So it's as simple as this. I create a channel, and a channel in Go, I'll talk about this uh, further, but a channel in Go allows you to communicate with different Go routines. So if I create a channel, I can create three Go routines, and what I want to do is just invoke this function and say hello. I did an interesting thing here, which was applying a simple delay to see how this would work. So what then I need to do is just wait for the channel to communicate something to me, and whenever a channel communicate, I will print that result. So from this, we would expect that first we want to see lay up here because it only has a 10 millisecond delay. Then we expect OB1, 400 millisecond, and then look. And here we go, lay OB1 and look. And it's as simple as this. This all processed concurrently, and this is all you need to do um, concurrent processing. So other advantages, as I said, it was built with the modern use cases of the web in mind. Uh, you have a really, really good testing framework out of the box. It's super fast and lightweight. Um, so batteries included. Everything you need, you will find in the standard library most of the times. And on a personal opinion, it's really fun to program in Go because you don't find yourself trying to identify what kind of magical thing is happening behind because everything is explicit. Okay, so a little bit of Go in a nutshell just to understand uh, the mechanisms of the language. So one of the particularities of Go is that there's no private, protected, or public concept. You have exported and unexported. Um, so you can port this to the public protected concept. So when you have something that is exported, it can be used with the whole world. When you have something that is not exported, you can only use it within the package. How do you differ between an exported and unexported thing is by capitalization. So the variable use me and the vari variable uh, and the type exported thing, it's, it can be used by everyone, even in different packages but this function cannot because it's not capitalized. And that's how you export or unexport. So you don't need to say func private or func public or func exported, you just capitalize or not. So the differ concept, um, it's, it's very simple to understand. The differ simply waits for the end of the execution of something to actually do the other thing. So if I say I want to differ this do something function and I call this print ln, what we expect to happen is that this will be called first because this will only happen at the end. And as we can see, we get exactly the result we expected. Uh, it's really useful in cases where you have to close servers or do some cleanup at the end and you don't want to forget or you don't want to have a piece of code hanging at the end and you're like, where did this come from? You just use a differ right next where you declare your things and it's really intuitive and simple to understand what's happening. Um, one of the big pain, pain points of Go uh, that people usually talk to me about is the fact that they have to use pointers. And it was a pain point for me as well because I don't come from a computer science background and I didn't work with pointers before, so at the beginning this was really confusing, but it doesn't have to be because what a pointer does is it holds the memory address of a value. So if I create uh, two variables uh, with 42 and 2701, doesn't matter, and I say that my variable p is a pointer to this variable i. When I print just p, I will not get the, the value, I will get the pointer to the memory. So, sorry. So when I run this, this p is the pointer to the memory address. What this allows you is, uh, you can alter the, the contents of structs or change variables, and it will have, if you have the pointer, it will have an effect on the, the variable you passed within. So the pointers are a cool way to, to change values in your structs if you want to or not. You have uh, full control of it. 
Um, so another thing that Go has is structs. Uh, so Go is not object oriented, by the way. You'll see that uh, afterwards. Um, so they have they use a lot of structs there. So what the struct holds is just collections of fields. So you can imagine this being uh, an object in, in typical object-oriented programming. So here I have a struct that is named person, and this person has a name and an age. And you can even assign methods to a struct. So this would be a method of a, of a class or something like that. So what I'm saying here is, OK, if, if I want to, act, uh, to define a method for this person struct, I just say that this is the bit that really gives me this struct. And then I can say that if I want the birth year, I will just return 2019 minus the age. Of course, this would not work very well in the real world, but it, it's just for demonstration purposes. The way you would use a struct is you can just initialize it like this. So you say the name and the age. You can even initialize it inline and without declaring that you are using the name and the age explicitly. And then you can just use your struct for whatever purposes you needed. Um, one of the common ways to also use a struct is instead of having uh, a passing this struct like in this way, you could pass a pointer to it. And then if you make uh, changes to the fields of the struct, they will be reflected. So if in this method I would say that my p.age would be 32, it would do nothing because it would not, it's not the pointer to the address, it's just the value that I'm changing, so it would not change the struct itself. Okay, so channels, I uh, already talked a bit about this, and this is really a, uh, a quote from, um, from Go by example. It's a cool website where you can see the different aspects of Go. So channels are the pipes that connect concurrent Go routines, and you can send values into channels from one Go routine and receive those values in another one. So this is the way you create channels. I'm creating a channel of a string here, and I can just say, I can invoke a concurrent function and say that I want to pass this ping into messages, and here I'm just waiting to receive something from that channel. So here I'm passing data to the channel, and here I'm receiving data from the channel, and then I receive the ping there. So, strange things about Go. Uh, I must say that I never experienced a, la a programming language that has so many complaints as Go. But I feel that the, evolu the evolution of Go is, oh my god, this is weird to, okay, I kind of like this, but this is still weird to, okay, this is awesome. Of course, some people still don't like it, but it's, it's a natural thing. So one of the strange things about Go, but I really like, because it simplifies your life a lot, is that Go uses composition and doesn't use inheritance. What this means is, you can have like these four structs. I have a film, species, vehicle, starship. By the way, this is inspired in Star Wars API, which is available online. And with composition, I can say that I can have a struct of people, and that these people can belong to these films, or, and can be of these species, can have these vehicles. And by composition, I can just create sequences of structs. And there's also something very interesting to look at here. It's this. So this field here is uh, what enables me to map JSON or XML variables. So instead of JSON, I could also have XML here. And, uh, and if I can even have JSON and XML if I have different uh, files that I want to parse. And what it says is, OK, map my name here, which is lowercase, to my name here, which is uppercase. Now, can anyone tell me why would I ever need to declare an uppercase name here and then do this mapping? Why didn't I just put the lowercase there? Exactly. So this, this is one of the main use cases. Other use cases being I can have like a snake case uh, coming from a JSON, but I really want camel case in my code. So you, you can really map these values really easily, and you just have to call that unmarshal function, and everything works perfectly. So another cool feature of Go is that you don't have to declare that you implement interface X, Y, and Z because it does uh, a type of duct typing, which is not at runtime, it's at compile time. And what you need to do is you need to comply to the methods of the interface. So if I have a reader interface, and I say that my reader interface has this uh, function here, then all I need to do to create something that complies to this interface 
is create a struct that actually has the read method there. It doesn't matter what it returns. And by doing this, I'm saying, okay, I'm compliant with that interface. No implements, no nothing like that. It's plain explicit. Another thing is error handling. So nowadays, a lot of people expect to have try catch, throw, finally, all of that. Go has nothing of it. Go just has a very simple error handling. And you can use this in several different ways. So one of the ways you can use it is yet you can create your own error types as long as you comply to the interface of error. And the interface of error is as simple as saying that you will have an error function that will return a string. As simple as that. As long as I do this, I'm ready to use error handling. And this is how I use it. So I have a, f a useless function that does nothing interesting, really. But what I'm saying is this function returns an error. So in this function, there's a piece of code here that's not really good. So I'm saying if 2 plus 1, I'm raising an error. So I will expect that I will get a random error, which I created before. And I'm putting a dump error as a message. So I would expect that if I fall under to this error, I would say this is a random dumb error. So the way I use it is I always say that when I use a function, I'm also taking care of the error. So errors are variables. For all purposes and intents in Go, errors are variables. So if I want to ignore an error, I can just not declare it or use an underscore. That's also an example of how you can ignore errors. Because you can, you can receive multiple values from a function, just like in Python, for example. And what I'm, sa what I'm saying is, if the error was not nil, then I want to do something with it. So if I run this, I will just log this was a random dumb error. OK, things that are good to know about Go. You will see, if, if you look at Go code, you will see a lot of short variable names. Now, I, I was also taught that you should always use long variable names, descriptive ones, of course, not too long. But never that I hear, OK, you, you can use R, W, R, B. And it, it was really confusing to me at first when I was, we, at Volkswagen, we always work in pairs. And at the beginning in Berlin, I would work with my pair saying, wait, wait. We're using R, but clean code says don't use R. You should use something more explicit. But they have a reason behind this. And the reason is you do not need to use so long variable names as long as it's really explicit what you're using. So if you're in a, a, a small scope, you can totally use small variable names. And in Go, it's the R and W. Everyone knows that R and W means reader and writer. It's because it's, it's so common as, as R. But if it, it's, it's an interesting uh, exercise to go look at the Go code source, uh, the Go source code, and see their variable names, because it's crazy. Um, another thing in Go, uh, this is, I think it's about to change, because version 2 of Go will probably have generics in it. But right now, they don't have generics in it. And it kind of bugs people a lot. Also, there is no functional style programming, at least out of the box. There are libraries that do it. So you do have to do for loops the old way and maps. You don't have maps, so you have to do a for loop and just do whatever you want with it. And this also gets people really p pissed off. We are already talked about this. No public, protected, or private concept. Uh, one interesting thing about Go is that if you want to follow the linting rules, comments are mandatory. So um, th you, you should always uh, document everything that you export. And you have rules to document it, but I won't go further into it. Just read the documentation. It's, it's really explicit. So also, this, this is a feature I really love. How many times do we have source code that has just variables that are hanging around that we don't use? Well, a lot of times. But Go does not allow it. Every variable, every, every type you declare, you need to use it. Otherwise, it's a compilation error. It won't compile. And you need to deal with pointers. So that's, that's always something that's not good. OK, let's go to something practical. Uh, let's build an API for a restaurant ordering service, just like Uber Eats. But ours is going to be Gopher Eats. Because Gopher, by the way, is the official mascot of Go. So here's what we are building. So we want to build a server that will basically handle orders that will come from Eat Street API 
but we also want to add some restaurants to our database so that we can improve our offer of whatever food we're delivering. Okay, so let's go. First of all, interacting with an external client. So usually in Go, when you interact with an external client, you create a client struct where you can specify the host, the API keys, and you can even inject your own implementation of an HTTP client for whatever reason it may be. This is just for an example. I wouldn't do this in, in a real case because probably I wouldn't need it, as you will see further. And the first thing we want to do when placing an order, I'll just show the placing an order example, is that we need to uh, marshal a JSON with the order request. So this, this new order is a, a type I defined previously, and this will return an order, which is actually a type that already has an ID in it, and it's, it's not, not uh, important for the use case. So after I marshal my, my data, so this means I now have uh, bytes of data that I can send, what I'm going to do is just make a, an HTTP request, and now I can say, okay, I want to make a request with a post method, I want to use as the endpoint my host and whatever endpoint they say it has to be, and I want to pass as the body my actual, actual bytes that I just marshaled. Okay, then I set my access token, I set my content type, and all I need to do to make the HTTP request is say, okay, my HTTP client do this request, and it will either return an error or a result. If it returns an error, we deal with it, so since we can return multiple types here, and I can just return nil because I didn't receive anything, and my error, and this is common practice. And now I am more, I'm able to handle my results. So first of all, I want to see if I have a good status code, if everything was okay. Then I want to actually read my body. And finally, I want to unmarshal the results of my body into uh, my order struct, which will contain the resulting data. And that's all I need to do to just interact with a client create something in the, in the back end or of that client and get a response and then just forward it up. So how would we test this? Well, we at, at Volkswagen, we, we use the given when then for our tests. So first of all, we always declare our givens. So we have some expected auf that we want to test that it happens. We have some expected content, some path, and here we have our actual content paths and requests. And this is a really nice feature, feature. So I can create a test server that will mock the actual server that is living somewhere in the world, so I'm not dependent on it. So I just say I want to create a new server. I have a handler function here. You, we already saw this when I created our first simple server. And I want to say, OK, when I got here, my actual path will be extracted from the actual request that I got my actual authorization header will be extracted also from this request. So I can get all the variables that got there and just write some mock uh, test order to check if everything went well and I received it and I couldn't marshal it correctly. So when I do this placing order, so here I'm just declaring my, my client. So when I do my order, then I expect to have no errors. I expect to have a correct path. I expect to have the correct authorization header there. And this is all I need to test. No third party libraries, no frameworks, nothing of that. OK, second example of our, of our API, collecting some restaurants. So what I want to demonstrate here is how you can very simply create a crawler uh, to actually gather data from the web. So the, the most easiest thing to do with a crawler, and here I'm using Yelp, Yelp as an example, is OK, I have my URL uh, where I say I want to crawl some location, which can be Lisbon, Porto, whatever, and I want to crawl at this start page. So I'm doing a get here. So it's, it's we, we, before we saw the example of doing HTTP.do, but we can actually shortcut it and just say I want a get. And I want to parse this, this, uh, this response that I just got from, from the, the, the web. 
So I will then just do extracting, I will just extract the restaurants for my restaurant uh, struct, and I'm done with it. So the way I can use it is I have a list of locations, I have a list of pages I want to visit. So for every location, for every page, sorry, there's no for each, there's no map, it's how it is. I want to do like a simple crawl. So I'm just crawling like sequentially through all the restaurants and waiting for all the responses. And then when I get it, I'm just going to range my, my list of restaurants and just print out whatever I got from there. But this is not very interesting because if you want to crawl thousands of locations and thousands of pages, we would wait forever for this to complete. So we can actually go concurrent. And here I'll also introduce the example of how you could use uh, a database to persist your data. So in this case, I'm just defining a, an interface that will have this execute method. And this is, it, it, you don't need to actually look much into what this does because this is related to, to uh, using Mongo with Go. But we expect to have an execute function with uh, the name of our column and the function that will be executed when we call it. So when I use my crawler, I can say that, OK, my crawler will have uh, an interface that has a type DB connection. So when I, when I actually uh, want to collect the restaurants, I will now use this Go keyword to actually make this concurrent. So then I will say, for every, so for every location and for every page, I want to crawl concurrently. And then here, I'm saying, OK, I'm expecting uh, these amount of, of, of restaurants and locations to be collected, so, or, or pages and locations. So I expect that my for loop will iterate while it's collecting these, these lists of locations and pages. And this select statement says, OK, now block my application until I receive this. So what I'm, here, what I'm waiting here for is for something to be sent in my channel of restaurants. And when something is sent there, then I'm just going to add something to my database. So what I'm doing here is creating a function that my interface expects to, to receive. And I'm just using this interface to do the execute. So this is a really nice way to use interfaces. So at the end, when I, when I receive something from the done channel, I'm just going to increment my counter because that means a new page has been visited. And here we have the, the crawl um, using the concurrency. So our crawl will expect a channel of type restaurant to be passed and the channel of type boolean to be passed so that I know when it's done and I know when I receive the uh, a restaurant. So what I'm doing here is actually deferring to the end of the execution and saying, OK, I just collected this restaurant. I'm good to go. You don't need me anymore. And then I just do the restaurant ex extraction. And the way I extract this, never mind all this code, because this is just HTML parsing. But whenever I get to something that I'm actually interested in, I'm just saying, OK, pass me this new restaurant that will have this name, location, and page into this channel, and then I am done. So this, this, this is how you can implement concurrency. As, as you can see, it's not difficult. It's pretty intuitive. And you don't need to have uh, a lot of bits and pieces to do it. And testing it is also super easy. So one of the first things we need to take care of is that nasty database connection that we just uh, said we were implementing. But since we used an interface, it's pretty easy to just mock it. And this is like a pretty standard mock and go. You just say, I want to mock my DB. And I want to say that uh, I have an execute function. And then I'll say that my mock DB implements that execute method that we said this DB interface has to implement. Uh, what we do is we just have a counter here to say to check that it was actually called, that we actually called the execute function, and we return whatever we want to be executed during this function. So I can create also a mock for this Yelp test server. So I'm creating this mock here, and I'm just passing a random body just to test that it works. And here is the defer to close my server. And in my test, I'm creating my mock DB here. So this is interesting, the way you mock things, because you can actually pass a function you want to always execute when you, when you run your, 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 your function. Right now, I'm just returning a nil, but you can return anything there. It's, it's, and, and it's really powerful. 
So what I just do is I create a crawler with my mock database. I, in I invoke the collect restaurant, and I just expect my mock database to be called because I expect that my method needs to put something in the database. Of course, we need a lot more tests to actually be thorough on this, but this is just an example. Okay, going live. To go live, we actually need to the server to call these things. Uh, but first, we usually implement what we call handlers because they are the ones that will handle the HTTP requests for us. And this is an example. So your handler function will, uh, or your handler will expect something that will comply to an interface that has this method, serve HTTP. So the serve HTTP expects that you pass it a response writer and a request, and that's all you need to actually be compliant to it, and you'll see how you can use it uh, later. And right here, we're just saying, okay, first of all, my orders handler only accepts a post, so if I have a method from my request that is not a post, then just write a header and say, this method is not allowed. Uh, then we just read the body, and we just have this new order, and we just say that, so wh whoever sent us the request will send this order in a JSON, and we'll just say, okay, unmarshal this, and if there's an error in marshalling this JSON, this probably means that they sent us a poorly formatted JSON. It may not mean that, but for simplicity's sake, it does. So we just say, okay, it's a bad request. And at the end, then I'll say, okay, everything is good. I'll create my order client, and I'll just place my order. And if something went bad, then I'll just say it's a bad gateway, for example. So Go has already a lot of HTTP-related stuff embedded in it, which makes it really easy to handle these cases. So in the end, we got the final order from our client, and now we're ready to actually just respond with this final order. And this is just an example of how we would implement a proxy, because this is all it does. It's just proxying the, the Eat Street API. So for our restaurants, we actually want to implement the crawler. So what we are saying is, um, here it's a different example. So right now I'm not using the survey HTTP just to demonstrate another way you can implement these handlers. So what I'll say is, I just have a function but this function also complies with the signature we saw before from the survey HTTP. So we expect a writer and the request in there. So once again, I'm checking the method. I'm creating a new database connection. I wouldn't do it here, but this is just for demonstration purposes. And creating a crawler, and I'm just saying, okay, go crawl some restaurants. And since I want this to happen in the background, this will just happen. I don't care anymore, so I'm just going to write the header. And what the user will see is he made the request, he got the feedback instantaneously, and some crawling mechanism is happening in the, in the back end. So it's, it's also super easy. And you can also really easily test these handlers. And now I'm introducing also a new conce uh, another concept that's related to Go, which is table-driven tests. And these are really useful so that you can really thoroughly test everything you want to. So you can have a lot of different cases. So just here I'm just putting two of them, but of course you can remember a lot of different use cases that you want to test. So I'm just testing a happy path so everything goes right, and I want to test what happens when I pass the wrong method. So what I do is I just range throughout these test cases, invoke this t.run function. It's a function that's uh, inherent for the, fr the Go testing framework. And now what I'm doing is I'm just creating an, a mock server for the Eat Street, just like I did before, where I would write my raw test order. And then I'm making a new request. And it doesn't really matter what you're putting here. What it matters is that you have a recorder there. And what this recorder will, be, will do is actually record everything that, will, that happens between this, this uh, handler request. So when I do the serve HTTP of my handler, then I can really easily say, okay, check if the code that came through the recorder is actually my expected code in the test. And if it's not, then my test will fail because there's a different code than I expected. I can, order, I I can also say, since I know which uh, order response I'm expecting from it, I can also say, okay, check if my order is actually the one I expect. And then I can verify it. And this is how I would test my handlers. I would just test that everything is, is working fine. So finally, the server. So how do we expose this to the end user? 
So there are several different techniques, uh, and I'm showcasing some of them here. So here you have an example of how you could retrieve environment variables from, from your, your system. So we use environment variables a, a lot these days to carry out, uh, to pass sensitive information, API keys, secrets, whatever. So this is, in Go, it's super easy. Just do os.getenv. Uh, you can also test for errors if you have in empty environment variables. It's up to you. And what I'm saying here is, OK, create my orders handler with the API key and the host I just got from there. And then I would just do, OK, for the slash API slash orders endpoint, my, handl my handler, so I say handle it, and my handler is this handler. And this will all work because I complied to the interface that it's expecting. So I have the serve HTTP method, and I have whatever I need. But I can also call a handle func. And instead of having to create a struct and implement the serve HTTP method, I would just say, OK, then I, instead of doing the whole thing, I just want to call a function when you reach this endpoint. And here we go, because our crawl Yelp is a function that has the response writer and the request there, so it's compliant to whatever the handle function func needs. And then I just say, OK, I'll listen on this endpoint. And this is really easy. Another way you can do it is actually go a bit further. So you could also use a multiplexer. And a multiplexer is uh, implicitly being created when you just use handle and handle func. But if you need more powerful stuff to happen and define, fine tune whatever you need, you can create a multiplexer. And it's pretty simple. So you just say your mux is http.newServeMux. And instead of saying http.handle func and handle, you just say that mux.handle func. And at the end, if the http.listen and serve, the mux needs to be in there so it knows what it will use. So it's really simple to do this server um, interaction. OK, so examples done. Let's go to a bit of good practices. So in Go, the the philosophy is less is more. So consider if you really need to use that framework to do something. So nowadays, we always have the tendency to go get a library for this and that, and we end up with thousands of libraries. But actually, a Go project can run with virtually no dependencies. So right now, we are, we are using Go uh, at Volkswagen. And we only have, I think, two dependencies. One of them is for a router. And we're using a router because it has added capabilities on URL parsing, and it's also faster. Uh, and it's well built, so uh, it's, it's a, good, a good use case. And we're also using it for OAuth 2 purposes. So for tokens and JWT, we also use an external library. But usually, like mocking frameworks, there's no need for that. Uh, assert libraries, there's no need for that. It's super easy to create just your own. So don't go filling your whole project with a lot of dependencies that you don't need. Uh, another one is like the short and descriptive names for variables. So you will see a lot of uh, reduced variable naming. So of course you wouldn't name a variable C instead of count if you would use that variable a lot. But you would also maybe go, go fine without naming your variable customer and just naming it cust. Because within the context of where you're working, cust may be perfectly understandable and clear on what it means. Uh, also, single letter variables are okay to use in limited scope. So if you have a for loop, if you have uh, a, an argument being passed into your function, there's no problem to use a short variable name because it's, it's pretty clear and the, the scope is so short that you can quickly find out what your variable is. Uh, so when naming your variables, you can use scoping as, as a guideline to see if you should name it shorter or longer. So package naming. Package naming is also something that has a huge impact on Go. And I find that around 70% of the struggles and let me think about it that we have in Go is regarding structuring the project and actually knowing which names to give to packages and how to split them. There's a lot of articles on this. I actually have a resources page. But the package names should definitely des describe their purpose. And once again, they should be sh short. So you should use transport and not transport mechanisms because the mechanisms is not bringing you any value there. 
They should also be clear and describe external dependencies if there are some. So you can have a package named Bytes and Postgres, and you will know what you could expect from there. You should also avoid catch-all packages because this is an indication that you're probably structuring your project in the wrong way because you just don't know where to put that. So maybe consider where or how to name your package and just don't put a util or helpers. Just create a math or if it's math-related problems or something like that. So another thing is when you use packages in Go, like if you are inside your package, you already know you're inside it, so it's no problem. But when you're outside, when it, you're in a different package using another one, you always use the methods and variables with first you use the package name and then the variable. So it's, it's, it's kind of, you stutter if you use, uh, for if you're in the package log and you say log info, you're saying log.loginfo. So it, it's, it's, there's no need to have the log there because you already know you're in the log package. So log.info is perfectly fine and you don't need to stutter when saying it. So when it comes to package organization, avoid creating either too many or too few packages. So the too few packages, you would fall under the catch-all case. Um, and if you, if you look at packages in Go, they really describe the purpose of the code. So if you go into the archive package, you would expect to see things related with tars and zips and whatever. If you go to crypto, you would expect things related to uh, crypto stuff, right? Uh, so one of the techniques used in Go to organize packages is to organize them by domain. So by the domain you're working on. And if you want to read more on this, there's a really interesting article created by this uh, person, Ben Johnson. There's a link there. Uh, by the way, all of this presentation is in my GitHub. You can check it out later. And you can, you can really see how you can organize packages by domain. Also, you, you will hear a lot of domain-driven development being thrown out there. Okay, so finally at the end of the presentation, I have some useful links and resources here if you, if you want to check them out and if you want to go into more detail. Uh, but you can do this offline. But, and also, I want to give credit to the Gopher artwork. So these, these gophers that you see lying around are created by uh, Ashley McNamara, and she actually has a GitHub repo. You can see it here with a lot of them. So it's, it's really nice to just print them out and have stickers. And recently, we were, we, we were, she actually made one for our team. So our team is Team Phoenix uh, within Volkswagen. And we had a visit from a person in the Go community, uh, William Kennedy. And he, we showed him that we had like a parakeet gopher as a phoenix. And we were like, yeah, we have a parakeet. It's all we can, we can have as a logo. And he said, oh, no, no, I'll just text Ashley and she will draw a logo for you. And this is the result and we're, we were really happy with it. So it's, it's our Go Phoenix. Okay, more importantly than all of this, we are currently starting or restarting because there is kind of already something starting up, but I think it, it's kind of lukewarm and no one actually were, was that active in bringing this up. But we are starting a Go community, and this is, this is becoming really serious because we will have the, um, the backup of GoBridge. And GoBridge is actually uh, an internationally backed up by Google network that is connecting all the Go communities around the world and gives us support. So when we organize meetups, it will be officially Google meetups, and it will be, I think it's, it's the start of a really nice thing in Go in Portugal. So if, if you are interested in being part of this, and when I, be, when I say being part, I actually say that you can also help us organizing and uh, help us uh, getting people for these events. So you can go to this link, and in this link you can see um, like a little form to submit just your name and email. And when we have more info on this, because we're still waiting from the, the GoBridge side to give us uh, details for how to, how to start this up, but when we have more, you will be notified on this. Uh, if you don't get the time to get this link, just talk to me afterwards or talk to anyone. Like all of our team is around with these, these codes, so you can talk to any one of us and we'll gladly give you the link or point you to someone who has the link. Uh, also, you can visit my Twitter or GitHub at the end because I have that, those contacts. I would also like to make an invitation to all of you um, to visit our offices. So we have some pretty cool offices in Ratu. Uh, we have a really nice auditorium there that we want to host 
a lot of meetups. We already hosted a few of them. We want to continue doing it. And we really have open door policy for everyone that wants to visit us and that wants to see the lab, see how we work, have lunch with us, have some beers, play some kicker or ping pong. So you're really welcome to visit. This is the address. Uh, it's really close to Larg du Rato. It's just uh, like two minutes up a street. And yeah, come and visit us. Just tell me something beforehand so that we can arrange it and we can make sure that you will be well received. But yeah, you're welcome to go there and see the space. And that's all I have to say. So here are the links to my Twitter, to the Volkswagen Software Development Center uh, Twitter as well, and also my email if you, if you need something. Actually, I, I noticed I don't have the GitHub here, but you can just uh, contact me if you want to know more. Yeah, thank you for watching and paying attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah, okay. One of the things that um, it's very unpleasant about Go is that you define like five or six trucks there and they're all, all public, but sometimes you don't need them to be public, right? So you can you just compose the, the type struct or? Uh, wait a second. Oh, some up the front. Uh, maybe a bit forward, I'm a bit lost. It's when you're, you're defining the, 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 the structs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here. Yes. So, what, what, so sorry, the what was the question? The I question is that, uh, imagine that my endpoint is only dealing, the next slide please. My endpoint is only dealing with people, so I will not have an endpoint for listing films or speci species or vehicles or starships, uh, but you're defining uh, them all as public in different structs. Can you actually compose them or you just have to redefine them? Uh, what you, you can, you can uh, what you're asking is if, if you can inline the structs here? Yes. Yes, you can. I would just I would just say it's an array of struct and then open the struct and then I can compose it. But is is that a good practice or? Uh it, there's there's nothing wrong with it. If you don't want like this is useful if you actually want to use the film or species in in a separate way, so as a standalone. Uh, but I just made this for the example, so this is not uh, really a real world uh, world example. Actually, it is because the API of the st the Star Wars API actually comes with this when you go to the people endpoint. But yeah, you can you can put uh, a struct in there. So anonymous structs are a thing in Go, and there's nothing wrong with it, honestly. Okay. And another question is uh, sometimes some APIs, when you're making a call, just uh, return different uh, payloads, like different uh, structure for JSON. How can you cope with that? You have a really cool flag in the JSON, which is called omit empty. So when you get empty stuff from the so for example, say that. For some reason, this people API wouldn't give you the films and species in, a re in one of the responses. Then you, you can just say omit empty and it will handle it gracefully. And even if you don't say it, I think it will just put it as a nil value or something like that. Okay, thanks you. Thank you. No problem. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question to you is that let's assume that I've just, you know, created this API, so how do I deploy it? Where, where can I deploy it? Are there services out there that allow me to run you know, Go-based code and APIs? That's a really interesting question with uh, an even more interesting answer. So Go, you, when you build Go, you have a binary. So virtually you can deploy anywhere that can accept binaries. So we are currently deploying on Cloud Foundry, which uses AWS behind. But all you have to say is go build something. You can even even target different uh, OSs. So you can build for Windows, you can build for Mac, you can build for Linux, and you can deploy anywhere. I, I believe there's virtually nowhere you cannot deploy a Go app because it's just a binary, so it will work anywhere. And you can just say, okay, give me a Docker that will accept a binary and just run this binary when it boots up. 
and you're done. So it's really no hassle deploying this. You don't need a JVM, you don't need nothing. It's really plain and simple. Okay, thank you. Any more? Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so I, I was looking at the, the examples that, we, that you made, and there are like some like standa standardizable ceremonial things to set up the server and to make the calls for the tests or even for the logic. And I was wondering how how like uh, the teams at Volkswagen deal with this part? How do they make it so that the, the code, all the teams follow the same standards or the same practices? Because um, there, there's a lot of ceremony like setting up the server and even the error handling uh, part, so. Well, usually we, uh, the teams at Volkswagen, we usually, we separate ourselves by products. So uh, we usually don't share repos because we're separated by pro products, so we're isolated. And one of the things that we actually are careful about is not to create too much dependency among teams. So what, what we do the most to try and follow the best practices is talk to each other or browse each other's repos, seeing how they do it. Uh, because even this case of setting up servers, even within the team, we usually don't have like a separate test helper function to set up these servers. We do it all. There's a really interesting, there's, there's a thing called Go Proverbs, and there's a really interesting proverb there that says, a little copying is better than a little dependency. And this is really true. We prefer to be explicit and not having to browse each file saying, oh, what does this do or that? Actually, the, the test server is, is, is a good example on how you could isolate that. But we try not to go out the boundaries of our teams to depend on other things because that could be bad because things can change unexpectedly and things stop working. You don't know why. And then you spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. So we don't have a lot of standardization other than we talk among each other, we see each other's repos, and we help out each other. So there, there's no effective like uh, base layer? Uh, no, no. We, we, we do have, um, we have a, a common repository of, of useful stuff. So for example, AWS clients, uh, an assert library. Uh, well, we have, we have bits and pieces that's, that's all centered in one of our GitHub repos. It's called Mango. And it's a bunch of utilities that you could use uh, in Go, but uh, that's that's how far we draw. So these little things of setting up test servers and all of that, we usually don't don't depend on them among other teams. Okay, no more questions. Cool. Thanks a lot for showing up. And if you have any doubt, you can always talk to me in private. <laughs>